I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Kim McPherson. Kim is the founder and CEO of Buy It Smart Automotive, as well as Sell It Smart Automotive Non-Prime Training. I want to find out today from Kim how she takes the difficulty out of buying a car and how she helps her customers get over some of those obstacles. Join me today in my conversation with Kim McPherson. I'm Ryan V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Kim McPherson. Good day, fine lady. Hello, how are you? I'm doing wonderfully well, and I do, again, thank you for doing this. I know you had a slush through the, the snow that's out there. I don't have any over here in Korea, but I do thank you for coming on. No problem. No problem. Kim, will you do us a favor and tell us what industry you're in and what it is that you're doing nowadays? So I'm in the automobile industry um, on the retail side. Um, and uh, basically, um, it's been my career for now, geez, more than 25 years. <laughs> I started when I was 19. Um, and almost immediately in the automobile industry, I thought um, it was a little archaic. Um, mm -hmm. And over the years, it just became more and more that way. A lot of pieces of the equation of how we deal with uh, consumers um, and, um, you know, get them matched the vehicles, for lack of a better word. Uh, Kim, seemed before we get into your exact business now, which I'd love to do, you mentioned 19. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your very first job? I mean, I think we both grew up in Sackville. So, I mean, maybe yeah. I have an idea, maybe so, what you would have done or like what sort of company you might have worked for. But what was your very first job that got you out of the house, even if it was a preteen babysitting or lemonade stand? Yeah, um, uh, I did a little bubblegum retailing for a while. <laughs> really? what, what did that entail? <laughs> Selling to your friends? <laughs> Yeah, just when we weren't allowed to have bubble gum. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> if you were here selling gum in class, here you go. No, um, I think my first real job where I was hired to do something was actually door-to-door uh, -door coupons. Um, that was a weird job. What kind of and, coupons? Um, I don't even remember. I don't remember. They were on these like cardboard pieces of paper mm -hmm. and now that I look back at it it probably wasn't even a legit company to be honest with you but I did have an interview and they did hire me and I wasn't really the legal age to be working I don't think either now that I think about it um <laughs> remember we used to make coupons <laughs> we used to make coupons to get into the sports stadium I don't know <laughs> I don't know if it was that sort of business but, but we had I don't them. know it was like these coupons for local mm -hmm. businesses I think um, like I was super young, I think it was 14 or something. Okay. Um, and, uh, I've always sort of been a entrepreneur. Like I've always just had to, the feeling that I could just, you know, do things for myself. So I started, uh, my, my, I guess real job would have been coaching. I coached in the summer in the canoe clubs and yeah. I coached in the wintertime in the figure skating, uh, in Sackville there. Um, just a little, the little tykes. So and, as you got up in towards high school, what were you thinking for a career before you actually got into the automotive business? What great question. Thinking? I had no idea and was at that time, um, it was constant pressure, really not my parents didn't have a whole lot of pressure on me. I was always told, do what you want, do what you love. Mm -hmm. That was a strong force in our household. Um, also, what did you try today that you didn't really do great at? That would, those were, those would be common That's conversations. That's a great question though. Yeah. 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 So I didn't really have a pressure to know, um, but I did have, you know, my dad's in education. So it was, you should go to university. Um, that was a pretty strong force. Um, and um, I remember in high school being told, if you're not going to do science, you're really not going to do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, which I believe now is very false, but I, I went into um, just a foundation year with, uh, uh, you know, I took a lot of science courses at Dow and slugged my way through and then said, you know, this is not, this is not, I don't, I have no idea what I want to do, but I, mm -hmm. I know <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> no. So, um, 
they kind of said, my parents just said, if you're going to be in the house, you need to get a job. And I wanted car, I wanted wheels and I couldn't afford to buy them. So <laughs> I saw an ad in the newspaper to sell cars and you can get <laughs> this a demo. Is the way. <laughs> that works. <laughs> I got on the bus and I went down with my resume and uh, this very, um, well, typical car guy fashion, right? Oh, we don't usually have girls apply for this job, but it would make mm -hmm. my team real excited if you were here and I was like oh my god what did I just what Let's did I just do so, yeah that's how it sort of started and uh yeah I didn't I ended up not um taking that job I ended up being incensed by this fella so mm -hmm. I uh, got back on the bus and then the next stop was the Oregon's on Roby Street and it was total mm -hmm. fluke and I walked in there and met this very kind man uh, he was the HR manager and he said we have a lot of females in the family um, and it's, you know, there's not many that can make it on the sales floor, but if you want to give it a try, I'm going to call your parents first. <laughs> my aunt worked there. I don't know. Maybe really? my aunt, Sally Chisholm. She, uh, she, she would have been there around that time, maybe a little bit before, but she was there for a while. Really? And O'Regan's has a pretty good name in Nova Scotia. Oh, yes. right? Yeah. 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 So as you, well as you got this job and start working in the industry, did you see this is the path you wanted or did you kind of meander in and out of it throughout over the last 25 years? Um, I definitely did some meandering, but for the most part, it's been consistent. Um, I, I've been circling, you know, I've been circling the drain and auto trying to change things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a difficult process. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, patience and uh, me me learning what I can and cannot do, um, just learning, you know, business in general, um, and just getting older and, and learning to calm a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, that different it's not perspectives, gonna, yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. So um, I started selling, and then out of frustration from not getting the promotion, I moved into a different direction, which uh, led me to a job um, in the promotional side of things, and then I started my own um, sale event company where we did sales for other dealers it was way back in 94. And then I tried retail. I did had a dealership with another partner into the U S that was a complete disaster. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I went into the training and consulting world and circled back around two years ago to pull together by it smart, which been kind of the, my passion, my, my, my long-term dream of where I was hoping that's so you now have Buy It Smart Automotive and you're training at Sell It Smart Automotive non-prime training. So what, yeah. does that, what does that entail, one on the, the consumer side and also for the business side of helping other people sell? Yep. Yeah, you got it. So when I started consulting, one of the big things that would come up often when I'd be in the dealerships were these like themes around, not trickery, but you know, how do you how what's the technique we're going to use to close that deal mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh you know how do we how do we um package this into a secret kind of mm -hmm. deal and i'd always be like there's, there's no secret if we wrote a book on how to properly execute the sales flow process um and in my case more on the financing end because i cater more to um clients that are uncertain of whether a they can get approved or b what that might look like in terms of their budget. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically take the sales fl process and flip it upside down. Instead of talking to a salesperson first, you talk to a finance specialist first. Um, get all of that, get, get that all organized. So then we're showing you vehicles that actually match your budget, match what the bank will do. Um, and there's varying degrees of that depending on uh, you know, the customer and where they're at and, and their headspace and what they know about their personal finances. But it would be this constant theme in the dealerships where it was like, okay, what's the, you know, what's the manipulation mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. And I hate to say that because there's great dealerships out there. There really well, is. There is a stigma. You got to, you're being honest. There's a stigma beside <laughs> by used car dealers, right? At first mm -hmm. or car dealers. There, it's well known around the world. I live here in South Korea and people, we sold a couple of cars we had recently and yeah. Korean guy said, hey, you can't trust those types of guys, right? And these are just yeah. Korean car dealers. So it's all around the world. It's there. And what you're doing is turning it upside down and changing that. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to. Yeah. yeah. Trying to. 
Um, so that's really, we, you know, from a consulting standpoint, it was almost shocking to, like people would say, that's so refreshing. And oh my God, what you, how did you come up with this concept? And I'm like, I just saw a problem and I told the truth. Like, I don't understand why this is such a big, you know, it turned into this big deal in that, in, in that part of the world. So um, I didn't want to let go of Sell It Smart as, as we started, as we started entering into the Buy It Smart um, side of things, because uh, we were able to now demonstrate that it's possible um, to use this process in a dealership that, you know, consumers love it. Um, so you're actually it. so confident in it, in Sell It Smart, that you're willing to tell other dealers about it and you don't feel that's a competition against you. No, no. Um, it, it, what I've learned from the uh, event marketing uh, experience was mm -hmm. that the more good competition out there, the better it is for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like it lifts everybody up, I find. Um, so no, there's, there's so much to do. There's such a huge void um, in auto as it relates to, uh, you know, helping the, the population of of Canadians that just uh, can't walk into a dealership, pick a vehicle and be confident that they can um, either buy it or be confident that they can buy it within a, within a budget that they're going to be comfortable with and not get themselves into trouble. So um, it's a bigger stat that I think most people really understand, really know. Um, but in Canada, it's about 40% of Canadians that do not have, or that have less than perfect credit. So, so would that enough. mean, there's a ding some sort that there, there's an issue for them to get a prime rate. That's, that's the idea for financing. Exactly. exactly. And marketing in auto and probably marketing in, in general can be uh, confusing. I'll use the word confusing rather than deceptive, but you know, it's like customers actually think that when they walk into a dealership, you know, they get whatever rates been advertised and they don't, you know, no one's been educating the, consumers to just say, you know, rates go with people. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can say 0% and I can say $99 bi-weekly on this truck. But um, at the end of the day, you know, it's that 1% that actually qualifies for some of these ridiculous ads. So well, you, you go down those Roby Street car dealership roads and they all say $99 bi-weekly, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> Everyone gets the deal. <laughs> we meant half weekly. <laughs> That's funny. God. Right, it's, it's it's sad, and there's a lot of people in that boat, as you said, forty percent. And so, what you're doing is pulling people into the office. And you're not even pulling people in. What you're doing, people want a car, right? You're not right. going to their homes and dragging them off the street, right, no. down the street and into your office. They're coming into the office, and you're first taking them into an office, talking about their story, talking about what is good for them, and then giving them a list of options. And I think I read somewhere that you, if you don't have it, you will help them find it somewhere else. That's right. We're, we actually have shifted more and more towards a 100% online experience, especially since COVID. It really allowed us to really flex those muscles. We've been retailing online, and I've been, and I've been coaching it in this, um, in this part of the automobile business probably for about six years, mm -hmm. uh, just because of the nature of the client. They want to have the conversation first. So it's natural for the customer to, um, you know, go onto their computer, see an ad and say, oh, that's me. Uh, I'll, hopefully someone will call me in a minute. And they put their information into, uh, you know, uh, a form. And, um, you know, and, and someone like my, myself would receive that lead. Um, and as we're coaching it, in the dealership level, we noticed that customers were quite happy if we could facilitate the whole sales process. And then, you know, it was probably about six years ago, it started to happen where everything just happened over mm -hmm. the phone. Um, and we were driving vehicles into people's driveways and having them sign documents on their kitchen tables. So that's shifted uh, since COVID because we can't do the kitchen table thing anymore. But then most of our banks went to electronic signatures and um, certainly this year with Buy It Smart, we probably, um, well, this year we have not signed up one customer uh, face to face. Um, our offices are used for, for our, our, our agents that come in, they use mm -hmm. the fax machine and the printers and, you know, we get together for team meetings. But other than that, we don't have a traditional dealership set setting. We've got uh, a setting that houses some vehicles 
um, and transports vehicles back and forth, cleans them, services them. It's like Amazon for cars. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't say that out loud because I know Amazon's coming. <laughs> they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna take my idea. <laughs> so you, you and your team were ahead of the game and you were prepared even for something as devastating and tragic as COVID. And yeah. this is, you're in the game of helping people get what they need. Kim, what is, a, what is the process that you go through being an entrepreneur? So you have buy it and sell it smart with the training as well. So what is a process that you go through in, say, a week's time? Um, you mean? What do you do on a daily basis, on a weekly basis to keep you busy? Oh, I thinking, gotcha. Thinking of the, the podcast of why we work and the things that we do. <laughs> What do I do to keep me busy? Ask my husband that. He's like so tired of me working sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many hours? Someone asked me on the podcast. He said, you better start asking people how many hours they work because that, that's an important topic too. So how many hours are you pulling in? I'd have to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know. I don't know A because lot. I'm probably not paying attention to all of those moments. You know, you mm -hmm. get up in the morning and as much as... Uh, that, that, you know, all these improvement books say, don't touch your phone, Take some you know, get, down, get on the treadmill, uh, you know. So I'm pretty good most of the time to put these um, uh, structures in place so that I don't burn out. Um, it's tough when you really love what you do. I find that, you know, it would be mm -hmm. easier for me to plug out if I didn't um, find that there's a lot of joy in what I do. Um, and I feel really proud of that because that was one of the things, you know, that my, my, my growing up, my father was a highly educated engineer with a great, great job. And then one day he came home and he said, I really don't love this anymore. And my mom said, you know, well, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to teach. And it turned, I was very young and I don't realize, didn't realize then what type of a shift that was for mm -hmm. our, mm -hmm. our family. Um, um, and the choice that was made for her for him to be able to enjoy his career and go back to school and study when we were youngsters. Um, but that's kind of the world that I grew up in. So, when it's, so my day to day is oftentimes me having to really focus on, okay, I'm, I'm on my way home from work and it's time to put my phone down. Mm -hmm. You know, my stepson, if he says to me, are you working again? That's my like cue to go. Oh, I've gone beyond, <laughs> Bust it. you know, that's right. Yeah, I've gone beyond the point where, I mean, this, this you know, he wants to play a video game with me or, or you know, and those moments aren't, aren't going to uh, last forever. So um, I try to pay attention to that a lot. Um, but putting Sell It Smart and Buy It Smart together, I'm finding they're merging more and more. Mm -hmm. It's your question. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I visualized it several years ago. I thought, I, I thought I'm not going to focus too much on how do I keep both balls in the air. I think what will end up happening is as the success of Buy It Smart, hopefully, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, continues to gradually um, get stronger and stronger, um, that more dealers would just want to know what this solution is all about. Mm -hmm. um, and we've transformed most of the training to an online platform also. So for me, if I'm not actively working in Buy It Smart, I'm, I'm uh, more consulting on a, you know, Zoom call, podcasts, um, you know, things of that nature, taking a couple calls here and there. COVID's really helped transition people that way. And, uh, and certainly um, just beefing up our online training platform um, to be able to offer it to more, more people so that I don't physically have to be around if they want to, um, you know, get the process and training. I don't know if I answered your question. No, it does. It does. It's, it, you're, busy. you're busy. Yeah, and you have, you're busy. You, you have enough <laughs> to do. What is some satisfaction that you get and even some difficulties in the work that you do in the automotive industry? Satisfaction's easy. I get some serious, uh, it's, it's actually, well, it's going to sound like I always, uh, anyways, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I love when the deal's done and the customer is just pumped yeah. and, it, and the difficulty I'm having right now is transitioning from a small team, um, to, to where I can be more involved with the customer to uh to letting them fly and get that enjoyment mm -hmm. themselves you know i'm kind of like 
oh, can I jump in and say hi to the customer? <laughs> and my, you know, I'll get like my sales manager who's like, no, <laughs> we got this. You can't call the customer. I'm like, oh, I just want to call and uh, get involved because it really is um, in what in how we do auto sales. It's really quite thrilling because the customer is so intense in the beginning and gradually, you know, we're just facilitating mm -hmm. a real need. It's not, we're not putting people in their dream vehicles. We're helping people get to work. That's the reality of most of what we do. So the stories we hear um, and, uh, and the ability to help people, you know, put their credit back together um, is a really cool thing. So I get it. What is, from. what is some of the, the, I guess the obstacles people face in buying their car and how do you get them through those difficulties? The major obstacle, which is, it's crazy to me because it's really a simple fix, but, um, and, and, and certainly why I started to formulate this different buying process, which inevitably ends up being buy it smart. I thought it was always going to be that I would just be a consultant and try to teach this. Um, and then it was just like, oh, forget it. Like somebody needs to come up with a solution because these guys just aren't getting it done. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a, like, it's not a difficult process to undertake. You just have to listen to the customer. Um, the obstacles that the customer is facing is they're literally walking into dealerships and telling people now, it used to be an embarrassing thing to say, you know, my credit's not so good. Mm -hmm. Now it's a little more mainstream. I mean, I'm sure it doesn't feel great to say it to anybody, but there's ads out there that say it's okay to go to dealerships now if you don't have the greatest credit. Um, uh, the sad thing about that is most of these dealerships that are advertising, it don't really have the solution. So they're sending people in for a lead and they haven't really spent the time to actually come up with a process that's professional, ethical, and makes the customer feel good. So they legit walk into a dealership and might even say to a sales consultant, look, I'm not sure if I can get approved. Mm -hmm. um, I just went through bankruptcy. Uh, my wife got sick and I had to take some time off work. Uh, my in-laws, you know, moved in with us and we had to get a nurse and the bills, you know. So there's all of these stories. My kid got sick. Oh my God. Like some of it is heart wrenching yeah, and customers be. will say that. And then what happens in the dealership is, okay, no problem. You need a minivan. Let's go drive this one. <laughs> and they go and drive it and they come back. They love and it. And they work the deal <laughs> and they love it. And then they get to the finance office with somebody that they haven't spoken to for mm -hmm. could be a day, could be weeks, could be a month. They've been in this process and they're finally excited. And then that person across the table in le like legit three minutes puts their information into a computer wah, wah, and goes, oh, sorry about that. oh I'm sorry, <laughs> that van's not going to work. And so mm -hmm. then they're, you know, then you've got two, then there's a fork in the road, either nothing's going to work that they know of because they're un they're untrained or they don't have the ability to be able to source out a different solution or that van will work. But I know we quoted you at 0%. You actually qualify for 12 and you don't qualify for 96 months. You qualify for 84. So your 450 payment is now 625, but you're okay with that, right? <laughs> Just sign here. We got it. So we just spin people into these situations mm -hmm. that, and it's not good for the dealership because that customer doesn't go away happy. Mm. That customer goes away pissed. <laughs> They're like, what the hell? You know, Johnny promised me. Johnny doesn't and know shit about financing. <laughs> that's, that's the obstacle. <clears throat> you mentioned skills earlier and developing your skill in the industry. Is there a specific one that you had to kind of perfect or you're still working on? Um, I would say always just working on that relationship piece and trying to find, um, you know, trying to find that humanity in every transaction, which I don't think exists enough in the world in general when you're transacting, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, and to me, that's the most valuable piece when I'm teaching somebody else about what we do. It's really not about the end um, object. It's not about the asset. It's about the process that we take to get there. And um, that really has to be tooled up 
for us, uh, for me, it's part of our brand experience and that's what I want and that's what I ask for in our agents, period. Um, um, the, feel, the feel good piece at the end is much better too when two people really mm -hmm. engage. Uh, I know about you and your story and I genuinely want to help you. Uh, which sounds so ooey gooey when we're talking about cars. I know that, but it's, it really does. Uh, we really see it in, in our customers. Um, and it also allows me the, the ability to, uh, from a realistic standpoint, gain that trust that's required. So when this family legit needs a minivan and can't afford it, and I have to put them in a sedan for, for eight months to a year to rehab their credit, that they trust me in that process. Um, so from a, from a business standpoint, from getting the numbers right, from not having our competitors come in and take our clients from us, mm -hmm. building that relation piece, relationship piece is, um, is a strong part too. So I always say it's good. Like the whole thing, the, the car business as crappy as it's been made out to be, if we actually just flipped over the coin, like it gets really an actually really cool human zone, experience yeah. yeah yeah it's really cool well i get thrills out of you can see in my face i get too excited about this stuff <laughs> well talking about experience do you have any advice for people knowing you were selling bubble gum and elementary school <laughs> maybe, um, or coaching and lake Bunuk, wherever you were doing yeah. your your paddling yeah. do you have any advice for people who are just getting into work or as you tried to do you, you meandered a little bit and trying a different career do you have any advice for people just getting into work one way or the other yeah it's funny my niece just just left high school and she said something to me that i really i got quite sad about actually um and she didn't mean to she just said you know i never thought about my life after high school and i was like oh my god that's a, that's kind of a I don't know. I, I uh, you know, for me, I always was thinking, okay, if I would see something or see someone else or see a lifestyle maybe that I wanted or, and I would say, okay, what does that person do? I was mm -hmm. constantly asking, what does that person do? Or see someone who's happy. What does that person do? Um, and that's just been a constant question that I've had as long as I can remember. But Kim, that's, I mean, you may not have noticed it, but there's, we, we grew up in Sackville, went to Sackville, mm -hmm. went to Sackville High. I grew up with people that I know for myself, I didn't always look five years ahead or look at that happy. I looked at a, an instance where, okay, I'm going to have my pleasure now and I don't care what happens tomorrow attitude. So I didn't really look past high school. So there's a lot of people like them. And it, it is sad. Yeah. <laughs> it truly yeah. is a sad way to live. And it's great to see people like yourself who go through high school or go through the system and you're looking further. And that's motivational. That's inspirational for people to see people like you that look further than what's in front of their nose. Yeah, it's, it's, it was too, you know, I give again my parents a lot of credit and athletics. Because in athletics, you're constantly, you know, there was a yeah, lot of, I don't know, if it was something that happened in the 80s, in the 90s, you know, there was all this visualization, which was so new. Um, and maybe it still exists in, in sport, I don't know, but they'd always make you visualize the move, you know, and figure mm -hmm. skating was certainly, before you try the jump, I want you to visualize executing it and landing. And, uh, and, and it kind of takes away your fear of failure, too. Where I find now a lot of kids, you know, they're like in this perfect bubble. It's like, I got to make all the right moves. And the pressure seems to be so intense that how do you, you know, you got to, you got to blow that stuff off and just, mm -hmm. who cares, man, go work at McDonald's, take the bus for a day, you know, experience, do a ride and drive with a cop. <laughs> I did mm -hmm. that once. That was like, I was like, ixnay on that. <laughs> Experience, you know, I thought I wanted to be a gym teacher and I was like, I'm going to really take a look at this, you know, Herman King. <laughs> I remember watching him going, mm, is this the life I want to have? Mm. No. <laughs> I mean, great for some people, just it wasn't for me. So I always had, was inquisitive like that. Yeah, yeah. Where is this, you know, where is this going to go? Yeah. And I don't know that I picked auto. It's just, uh, I think a lot of the worlds just came together in that I saw a challenge that I felt could be changed up. And frankly, I think if there was a lot of ladies back then that were in it, I probably wouldn't have been 
I probably wouldn't been so driven to mm -hmm. get in and and really work that industry. What was your advice so, for your, was it your niece? What was your, did you have advice told, for her or you just cried? Yeah, I told her to take a, um, just her, cause she draws, she's an artist. And I said, just flip over the page and just, just start drawing. Like what do you, or write it down. They spend many pages, but like this, it, after grade 12, it's like this. Like, there it is. What do you want to put on that page? And no one's going to judge you for it. Keep it to yourself. But just start feeling it out, you know, write it down. There's nothing that you can't do. And the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to fail. But if you don't try, then you're in the same spot you were in before you, you know, your worst fear is that you won't make it. Well, you're not now. <laughs> so then I, do that's just how yeah. I always thought. I was like, so what? I scrape my face. Well, other than people laughing at you, which is like, whatever. <laughs> what about in your, you've mentioned it a couple of times and just, I think your company embodies character and integrity. What is a character trait that is most important? What you've seen in the automobile industry or for you? Um, empathy, empathy. Um, I find just being able to, get in, really listen, engage with the client, really understand to the degree that you can what they're actually going through. So you mm -hmm. can, you know, um, you can not get in it and get all in the mm -hmm. emotion, not, not, not being sympathetic, but being able to be a good coach, be a good guide. Um, and I really look for that. If I'm going to hire somebody, I really look for that. Um, if, you know, how are we going to solve this problem? Not what do you know about what's under the hood of a vehicle? I could care less about that. It, it might, you said heart wrenching some of the stories that you hear, and it must be hard to to stay professional at the same time without being overly sympathetic. Like, oh, here, just have the car and walk away. I mean, there. Yeah. You, you might, you know, you're not going to, but the, maybe sometimes. But the idea of hearing these stories, and you're talking about forty percent of the people who have some story. And then that's the reason why they're coming to you or able to come to you and to trust you with their story and hope that you can come up with a deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be tough. I think because the financing piece is an extension of what we do and we can't manage that. Um, you know, I can manage it to the degree that the bank will say yes or no to a customer. Um, they end up being the bad guy. Uh, it's how we're able to, you know, maneuver and work within the, their rules um, as lenders. And so I always say to clients, listen, if we can't do anything right now, if there, we can't get a lender to loan you some money to get you back on the road, there is a solution in that uh, we will find out what it's, what's required to ultimately get you there. So, you know, sometimes I'm referring people to, you know, credit counseling or other services. We try to link our company around um, other companies that can help people get back on their feet. That's if that's what's, uh, if that's what's required. And then, you know, if they come back, great. And, uh, and you know, that's, that would be nice, but ultimately we want to get people set off in the right direction. I was, I have this next question for you, which is, exercise and education and where you place that in your life especially mm -hmm. knowing that at first you started at Dow and you're like eh, and then you know even your niece of finishing high school and giving her advice there and mm -hmm. exercise but also do you direct some of your customers to more towards maybe financing on, on ways to help budget their their income yeah. do you guys have yeah so um so from an education standpoint I did end up going back. I actually mm -hmm. studied theater at Dow, uh, which I use daily, which is funny. Um, uh, and, um, and then went right back to the car business because I had so much student loan debt. It was, mm -hmm. it was a way that I could uh, pay it back um, and then became decent at the, at the, in the industry. And, and so the, in terms the, of you know, your view for listeners of education, so whether it's formal or informal, how, how do you value that? Um, I think, I think each individual person has to take a look at what they want and whether or not 
formal or informal education or any education is of value. Um, I'm constantly trying to educate myself mm -hmm. uh, in my industry and in my craft, which is relationships and trying to be the best, you know, stepmom, the best wife, the best professional. Like there's always so many um, areas where, and so much information now, you know, whether it be, I'm a big, I'm a big listener to books. I love downloading books. And uh, as a consultant, I would drive so much. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm constantly trying to feed my mind with things that are going to improve myself. I'm, I'm trying to be better. I'm certainly not perfect at it, but that's, you know, that's constantly something that's in my, in my mind. Um, I think that's the athlete in me too. It's, it's, you know, God, it's such a better day when I get up and get my workout in, you know, yeah. everything just clicks better. Um, so it's that self-improvement thing. And that's where I value education. Is it, is it improving you and what you bring to the world? And are you being, are you contributing more and being better every day? God, I sound like Oprah or something today. I don't know. I'm like listening well, to myself. And, well, and, and your <laughs> exercise, how do you fit that into your schedule? Is it a number of days a week? Is it? Uh, I try. Yeah. I, I probably, <laughs> I probably was more consistent as I'm getting older. It caught it's harder. Um, but I, if I don't do it in the morning, it's not getting done. Um, and, uh, I've been fortunate enough over the years. Uh, I used to, you know, have to travel to the gym, but over the years I've started to build up a, a home gym. So, um, to a degree, I don't know that that's helped though. You know, it's like I go down there and I move the laundry off the treadmill. <laughs> Dust it off. <laughs> but yeah, if I'm going to get it done, it's in the morning. Um, I'm probably pretty consistent at at least three times, four times a week. And, you know, it's changed. I used to get down there and, you know, go crazy for an hour. And now in my forties, it's like I get on the treadmill and get her on an incline maybe for a little bit. <laughs> I remember low. I had a debate with someone once we were jogging and I, they were pointing out someone walking and say, they're like, Oh, they're exercising. I'm not, they're not exercising. They're walking. <laughs> Nowadays I go for a walk. I'm, I'm done. My exercise. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. What do you have for a goal for whether it's buy it smart or sell it smart or any of the other adventures you want to get into? What is your overarching goal? Um, mm. I, the, where I see Buy It Smart going is that. Did you not um, buy a new location most recently? Did I see? I yeah, not buy. I'm not that, I'm not that well. We just, uh, we have a, I, I guess consider more like a boutique location. Mm -hmm. So in Burnside, uh, you're familiar enough. And mm -hmm. then about 20 minutes down the road in Sackville, uh, there's another location where that's where we do most of the service of the vehicles. Mm -hmm. It's a big you know, there's a big lot there. Um, and because we're transporting our vehicles most of the time, um, it's really just a spot for truck to come in, pick up some vehicles, drop off some vehicles, service, clean them. Uh, so it's more of a traditional setting. Mm -hmm. But when we meet our clients, um, the way that I visualize Buy It Smart would be very similar to any bank but we want to keep it, you know, um, you know, where someone can come in and speak with a client and ultimately be able to find out, okay, what is, what can they do before they go shopping for a vehicle? So our slogan is actually know before you shop. So come in, talk to one of our agents and know what you can, much like a mortgage broker. Um, and where we look at expanding and actually just started to do so is into everything you can think of to finance from consumer financing to business to business related uh, type of things so that the smart way to buy pretty much everything is finance first. So that's the big, I get nervous telling people because that's the big, uh, that's the big play. I, I, I would, I would want buy it smart to be a name that people see as, um, as a way to get that information and not having to go one bank to one bank to one bank that they could work with one person for many different uh, things that they need to finance in their life. Is there anything that people may not understand about you? 
and the industry that you're in so they can have a better appreciation. (laughs) (laughs) Have a better appreciation of what you're accomplishing and obviously what you're doing, you're turning the industry upside down by doing what seems to be the right thing. That's one thing. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's, uh, it's like, it just feels right. And here's the thing. I'm not afraid of profit either. You know, some people think I'm like, I'm listening to myself talk and I'm like, oh God, I do. I sound like uh, ooey gooey here. But um, I think probably the one thing that I would um, say about me from a career standpoint was that it was really important for me to love what I do. And it was also really important for me to find something that I felt, however big or small, I could impact a little bit, change something that I felt wasn't so you know, like when you're in a, when you're in an environment, you're like, mm, there's just something about this. That's not right. We don't operate like that. If I have smart, it's right. It feels good. When we're dealing with our customer, it feels good. And can I make it profitable? Mm. Like it's gotta be something where the people that work for me, uh, can build a life of their own that, that they also can have some of the nice things in life. They work hard. And so, you know, we're not a, we're not a non for non for profit by any means. Mm. Um, and the, 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 one of the things that I guess I'll tell you that I noticed is that our clients get that and they're good with it. We, they do not beat us down and negotiate with us. And um, it's quite a different experience that way. And uh, we're respectful of the fact that we sell vehicles in the market value. We give them, we use programs that allow us to do trade appraisals that actually scrub the industry's wholesale market and retail market. Um, so we're dealing with fair market numbers, which is great for profits. It feels good, it's great for profits. It's like a good, good, good. When I'm talking to a dealer, I'm like, why would you not want to uh, you know, have a buy it smart in your franchise dealership? It's, it's good for business, it's good for the customer, it's good for your employees. It's just good and you're gonna make money. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah, and that's good. <laughs> Kim, I only have a couple of questions for you uh, remaining. Is there any adversity that you have faced in life that you use either as your motivation or sometimes it kind of gets you down in the work that you do, but to use that adversity to encourage others in the adversity they face in their work? Um, hmm. I don't want to use the lady card in my business, but that certainly has been uh, one of the things that through my career, certainly into the nineties, more and more, there's a lot more professional women in auto. Mm -hmm. Auto should be very grateful for that. It's changed a lot of the ways that uh, the industry operates both in service uh, and retail and sales um, and high level, um, high level uh, VPs in auto. So awesome to see, but in the beginning it wasn't that way. Um, and, uh, I would say, and I'm, I have to learn it because I'm quick to react. Sometimes I've learned through my mistakes. Uh, you know, I've told many of the rude customers <laughs> to leave in not so nice terms as a youngster. Um, so I've learned patience, um, and, you know, trying not to, you know, trying to see, the other the other side of the equation mm-hmm. for what it is um and i would say that my the, the the strongest tool that i had going for me was that i did know it better um i did stay on top of mm-hmm. the industry i i talked with my feet i didn't open my mouth so when anyone had anything to say about you know why i belonged in a certain role or um, if I could start this business or any one of them, when I walked into a dealership to do consulting and all these old guys are like, oh, what's this girl going to teach us, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, it was just a matter of really just keeping, just ignoring the naysayers, mm-hmm. being confident in what I knew and, uh, and, and putting that out there without, you know, without and, uh, the fear of, yeah, yeah. And just, and just knowing that I knew it. So I could do it. Um, that was the whole piece too, with bringing by it smart together was that I had always been teaching it, doing it. I've had to, cause that's what I had to do as a lady. I couldn't say, guys, you need to go out there and do that. 
uh, they wouldn't listen to me. Mm -hmm. Had to be, okay, here's what's going to happen. Watch. And I would go out and work with the customer and bring people with me so they could see how it would work. And that transitioned into consulting and showing. Um, and so, you know, buy it smart is, is just an extension of that. It's, you can, you can do it. This is what we're doing. Uh, we think it's something that can work in franchise stores that, you know, they can, um, they can use a similar model if they don't call it the same thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, showing, not telling that's, that's probably, and not being afraid to fail. Like you can't, you can't be afraid to scrape your face on the pavement. If you're going to try new things, you just got to be able to deal with it, get back up and it sucks, but it usually means you're going to get to something really cool. Mm -hmm. Kim, how can people reach you? How can they get in contact with Buy It Smart, Sell It Smart? Probably uh, the best way is the website because there's so there's so many ways on there to reach us. Uh, it'd be Facebook and you check out our YouTube channel. You can uh, reach out to us in the on the comment side of things. And that's just uh, www.buyitsmart.ca. Um, and uh, or my email address is, is uh, the same, just kim at buyitsmart.ca. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to, uh, to, uh, hear from anyone. That's for sure. Yeah. One final question, Kim. Uh Oh, this and is the hardest is, one. Yeah. This, this is not the hardest. <laughs> why, why do you work? Hmm. Um, I, I just love it. I do just love what I do. Um, and I also want to build a, you know, I want to build a nice comfy lifestyle for, for, um, um, for the people that work for me, for myself, for my stepson. Um, and, um, and I enjoy bringing solutions to our customers that actually help them. Um, uh, I find that to be really probably the coolest thing that I do is that in an industry that people predominantly hate, <laughs> uh, we're putting, you know, smiles on faces and actually helping them through some difficult times. And not only that, for people who don't know of Lower Sackful, you have a lot of competition. And for, yeah. <laughs> for you to be holding your own, you must know what you're doing and doing it well. Yeah. They say uh, the largest, largest car, car car <laughs> per capita. <laughs> in, <laughs> is it? I thought it was the whole world. But <laughs> it might be the whole world. <laughs> it might be the whole world. There's a lot of them. But oh, yeah. if, you're, if you're holding your own, then... You're yep. doing well and you know what you're doing. Kim there McPherson, founder and CEO of Buy It Smart and Sell It Smart Automotive. Thank you. I appreciate your time and I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have, great to be on. Thanks for having me. I'm Brian V and this is Why We Work. That was a great conversation with Kim McPherson. Check her out at Buy It Smart, Sell It Smart. As for me, check me out at any sort of podcast host, whether it's Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, any of them, Apple, uh, as well. If you can comment, share, like, uh, hit the notification button down below on your YouTube channel, that would be appreciated. It encourages me to know that it's useful for you. And if you'd like to be a guest, or if you know anyone else that would make a good guest and bring value to the topic of work, you can email me at whywework.brianv at gmail.com. Again, I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work.